In the previous video, we looked at monoids. These are sets of elements with a binary operation that is associative and has a neutral element. The operation does not have to be commutative and it does not have to support inverses. Monoids are ubiquitous because they describe any kind of transformations of mathematical objects. Now, what if we limit ourselves to symmetries of objects? Not just any kind of transformation, but symmetries specifically. In this video, I want to show some examples, leading to the conclusion that we need an extra condition. To make symmetries work, we require every symmetry transformation to have an inverse. I will show you why this is the case, and then we will look at a specific example the rotations and reflections of a square. This is a square. When I rotate it 90 degrees, it looks exactly the same as before. When I flip it over its horizontal axis, again it looks the same. This is what symmetry is all about. You transform an object, but you don't see any difference. The object doesn't have to be a geometric shape. For example, here is a polynomial in the variables u and v. If I swap the names of the variables, I get exactly the same polynomial again. So swapping the variables is a symmetry transformation on this particular polynomial. If I do the same name swapping on this other polynomial, it does not stay the same. So the name swapping operation is a symmetry for some polynomials, but not for all. In a similar way, this triangle does not stay the same under a 90 degree rotation. A given transformation may leave some objects the same, such as the square, but leave other objects different, such as the triangle. Next, Think carefully about what happens when we perform two symmetry operations after each other. The first one leaves the shape looking the same, and so does the second one. So the combination of the two symmetries also always leaves the shape looking the same. In other words, the combination of two symmetries, one after the other, is also a symmetry. Leaving an object intact twice in a row ends up leaving it intact overall. Good, it looks like we have something interesting here. We can always combine symmetries into new ones, using a kind of concatenation operation. We concatenate two rotations to get a new rotation. We concatenate a rotation with a flip to get a different flip. If this reminds you of monoids, give yourself a pat on the back it's actually quite easy to show that the concatenation of symmetries is indeed associative. Can we define a neutral element? That's also easy. Just do nothing at all. Leaving the shape alone is a trivial symmetry. When we concatenate it after a rotation, the net result is just the rotation itself. So yes, leaving the shape alone really is the neutral element, the symmetry that doesn't do anything. But now we come to something brand new. Suppose you rotate the square 90 degrees counterclockwise. This leaves the shape intact. It is now quite natural to do the opposite rotation, 90 degrees clockwise. This cancels the earlier rotation, so the net result is that we didn't do anything to the square at all. The clockwise rotation is called the inverse of the counterclockwise rotation. It should make sense that the inverse of a symmetry is always another symmetry. Both leave the object intact. So on top of being a monoid, symmetries also always have inverse symmetries. We can add this to our list of properties. The result is called a group. Every group is a monoid, but some monoids are not groups when they don't have inverses. Inverses are usually written with a minus one exponent above them. That's because they are very similar to inverse fractions. When you multiply by five, 
the inverse operation would be to multiply by 1 over 5, which can indeed be written as 5 to the minus 1. Formally, inverses are defined like this. If you do a transformation, and then you do its inverse, the net result is that you didn't do anything at all. That's the neutral element by definition. The product of an element with its inverse is always the neutral element. Math articles and textbooks often use the name G for arbitrary group elements, and E for the neutral element of the group. The neutral element allows you to do nothing. Inverses allow you to undo anything. When you first do something and then undo it again, the net result is that you haven't done anything at all. That's exactly what this formula means. Why are inverses so useful? Well, first of all, they allow you to solve equations. For example, the equation 5x equals 1 can be solved by multiplying both sides with the inverse of 5. This causes the 5 on the left to get cancelled, which is exactly what inverses are for. But inverses can also be used for more abstract purposes. For example, let's say that you get ready to go for a walk. You put on your socks first, and then your shoes. After coming back from your walk, you want to undo this combined transformation. Note that you first have to take off your shoes, and then your socks. So, in general, the inverse of a concatenation looks like this. First invert the most recent transformation, and then the older one. Thanks to the rules of groups, you can prove these kinds of abstract formulas once for all possible groups. They work for matrix multiplication, for the symmetry transformations of geometric shapes, and for all other groups as well. Let's look in detail at the rotations of this square. To make it easier to see what is going on, I have put an asymmetric logo on the square. This makes it easier to see the result of each symmetry transformation. We basically only have four possible rotations that maintain the shape of the square. We can rotate by 90, 180, or 270 degrees. And of course we also have the neutral element, which rotates by 0 degrees. Rotating by 360 degrees is the same as rotating by 0 degrees, so we have no further rotations to consider anymore. Now we concatenate two rotations. We can summarize the results in a table. For example, if we do a rotation by 90 degrees, and then a rotation by 180 degrees, the net result is a rotation by 270 degrees. This is how rotations can be combined to create new rotations. This kind of table is called the Cayley table of the group. The table allows you to look up the results of concatenation. Many of the properties of groups are plainly visible in their Cayley table. This is going to help us a lot in future videos, so let's make sure that we see these properties very clearly. First of all, I should point out that the concatenation operation is defined for any pair of rotations, and that the result is always another rotation. This may seem trivial, but it will be important later when we study more advanced groups. In the table this property is obvious. There are no empty cells, and each cell contains one of the elements we already had. If a cell stays empty, concatenation is not defined everywhere. And if we suddenly got a brand new object as a result, our group would not be closed under concatenation. Next, it's easy to see that the zero degree rotation is the neutral element. Its row just repeats the top header of the table, which means that the neutral element does not do anything when you concatenate it on the left. In a similar way, its column just repeats the left header because it does not do anything when you concatenate it on the right. Each element in the group has a unique inverse. This is represented in the table by the fact that each row and each column contains exactly a single zero degree rotation. For example, the inverse of a 90 degree rotation is a 270 degree rotation, 
because when you do one after the other, the net result is no rotation at all. 180 degrees is obviously its own inverse. The final property for groups is associativity. This one is much harder to visualize in the table, so we won't get into that. This table has another property that you've probably noticed. The table is symmetric. Each entry is the same when you reflect it over the main diagonal. This is because the concatenation of rotations is commutative. It makes no difference whether you first rotate by 90 and then 180 degrees, or vice versa. The result is the same. It's important to remember that groups do not have to be commutative. We will soon see an example of a Cayley table that is not symmetric. Allow me to show you a different group for a moment. Imagine a clock with only four digits on it, from 0 to 3. We can start counting up from 0, but as soon as the hand goes to 4, we fall back to 0 before we continue counting. When you add 2 plus 3, for example, the result is not 5, but 1. This is known as addition modulo 4. We will look at modulo arithmetic in more detail in an upcoming video. The Cayley table for addition modulo 4 looks like this. Once again you can verify that it has a neutral element and that each element has an inverse. Here's the same example we saw on the clock. 2 plus 3 equals 1. Now check this out. Let's put the earlier Cayley table on the screen again. Here it is, the rotations of the square. Do you notice a similarity between these two tables? They're actually completely identical, except for the names. You can verify that each relation in the table on the left also exists in the one on the right. When two Cayley tables are the same, we say that the groups are isomorphic. This literally translates to having the same form. We can limit ourselves to studying only one of these groups because the other one behaves exactly the same way. It's easy to understand why these two groups are isomorphic. The rotations of a square even look very similar to our four-digit clock. The rotation angles are all multiples of 90 degrees. To perform two rotations in a row, you just add the angles. That's the key. Angles are added. And as soon as you go over 360 degrees, you fall back to 0 degrees. That's exactly what addition modulo 4 also does. So, for all intents and purposes, the four rotations of the square behave exactly the same as addition modulo 4. Here is another familiar group that is isomorphic to addition modulo 4. It's the group of the complex fourth roots of unity. When you multiply two of them, you add their angles. So, once again, we have a group of four elements that behaves exactly the same as the other two. Okay, now groups can be visualized not only with a table, but also with a graph. Let's put all of the possible versions of the square on the screen at once, and then show how we can transform from one to the other. The square at the top is the starting position. If you apply the zero degree rotation to it, it just stays the same. This square over here on the right is the result of rotating the starting square over an angle of 270 degrees. Each square represents one of the four symmetries in our group. Think of the squares as saying, this is the end result of applying the corresponding symmetry. The arrows, however, are very different. All arrows in the graph represent the same symmetry, the 90 degree rotation. That's all we need. By just repeating that rotation a number of times, we can perform all of the other rotations. We say that the entire group is generated by the 90 degree rotation. The graph becomes a cycle, and this is why such a group is called a cyclic group. This kind of graph is known as a Cayley graph or Cayley diagram. 
and we can draw it for any regular polygon, not just for a square. For a polygon with n sides, we have n rotations, each one nth of 360 degrees. For such groups, the Cayley graph is always a cycle because you just have to repeat the smallest non-zero angle to reach all the other angles. This is worth remembering for later. The smallest non-zero angle, in other words, the one right next to the neutral element, is the generator for the entire group. We looked at rotations, but there is another set of symmetries of the square. There are also four reflections, around a vertical axis, a horizontal axis, and two diagonals. Let's add these four reflections to our group. I use H for the reflection over the horizontal axis, V for the vertical one, and D1 and D2 for the diagonal flips. We now have eight symmetries in total, so our Cayley table gets a bit bigger. But you can verify that it still satisfies the properties of a group. The neutral element is still the same as before. And each row and column contains a neutral element. As you can see, each of the reflections is its own inverse. This makes sense. When you flip over an axis, and then flip over the same axis again, you always get back to where you started. This time, the table is no longer symmetric across the main diagonal. This means that our extended group is no longer commutative. For example, a 90 degree rotation followed by a horizontal flip does not give you the same result as a horizontal flip followed by a 90 degree rotation. Again, this is not a problem because groups are not required to commute. But it's interesting to see that a commutative group can be extended into a non-commutative one. But here is a much more interesting pattern that you might notice about this table. It seems to have an internal structure. It consists of four blocks, and each block contains either only rotations or only reflections. There is no overlap between these blocks. That's because reflections and rotations behave differently when we give the square two distinct sides. Imagine painting one side of the square red and the other blue. A rotation never flips the square over, so it always keeps the color the same. But a reflection flips the square on its other side, changing the color. The technical term for this behavior is orientation. Unlike rotations, reflections flip the orientation of the square. They lift it off the screen and flip it around, so that its other side becomes visible. Rotations don't do that. This simple distinction is going to become incredibly important later, when we talk about continuous symmetries and physics. The internal structure of the table now makes perfect sense. It basically tells us which side of the square is facing up. The combination of two rotations keeps the same side up, so it must be another rotation. The combination of two reflections changes the color twice, so the square ends up with its original side facing up. That's why two reflections combine to make a rotation. But when you combine only one reflection with a rotation, the square gets flipped over only once. Its color, or orientation, changes. That's why the result must be a reflection. So, this table has a block structure. Two sets of four group elements with no overlap. The elements always stay separate, like parallel lines that never meet. Is this only true for the symmetries of the square? Or do all groups have such a block structure? Where does this extra structure come from? We've defined groups using only a few simple rules, and those rules don't mention anything about blocks or parallel sets or orientation. Or do they? We will spend more time exploring these questions in upcoming videos. Spoiler, the internal structure is not a coincidence. In the meantime, it's important to note that the rotations are a group but the reflections by themselves are not, 
because they don't contain the neutral element. The neutral element leaves the square alone, so it doesn't flip the color, and so it cannot be a reflection. Whenever we manage to divide a group into blocks, only one of those blocks can be a smaller subgroup, and it's always the block that contains the neutral element. Remember that we could generate all rotations by just repeating a single 90 degree rotation. But now that we also have reflections in our group, a single generator is no longer sufficient. A single rotation can only produce rotations. We need two generators this time, a rotation and a reflection. Let's pick R1 and H to be our generators. All other symmetries can then be produced by repeating these two generators a number of times. Note that we often write the concatenation of symmetries with a dot, as if it was a multiplication. If you're familiar with basis vectors in linear algebra, you know that any vector can be decomposed as a linear combination of the basis vectors. The generators play a similar role in group theory. Any group element can be decomposed as a combination of generators. This makes it much easier to study groups. Often when we check some property for the elements of a group, we only have to check it for the generators, and then we know that it applies for all other elements as well. Or when a homomorphism maps the elements of a group to some other set, you only have to know where the generators get mapped to. This is very similar to how you can figure out what a linear transformation does to all vectors by just studying what it does to the basis vectors. We will talk about this a lot more in the series on linear algebra. On the Cayley graph, these two generators are typically shown with two different colors. The 90 degree rotation is shown in blue. The reflection that we selected as our second generator is shown in red, and it flips each of the four squares to their other side. After such a flip, the 90 degree rotation then works in the opposite direction. Note that I draw the blue lines as arrows that go only in one direction. The red lines can be followed in both directions. That makes sense because a reflection is its own inverse, so you can always go back by just doing the same reflection a second time. The Cayley graph is an excellent summary of the group because you can read many important relations right off the graph. An easy example is this loop in the middle. It tells us that we can always get back to our original position by doing four 90 degree rotations in a row. Here's a more advanced loop. If you rotate, flip, rotate and flip again, you also always end up back where you started. Mathematicians read these kinds of equations to get a better understanding of how the group works. Again, we can generalize from the square to other regular polygons. In this example, n is 3, so we're talking about the symmetries of a regular triangle. A polygon with n sides still has the n rotational symmetries we already saw earlier, but now there are also n reflections. The Cayley table always shows a block structure in which the rotations are a smaller subgroup and the reflections are a separate block but not a subgroup. The interaction between these blocks shows us how the orientation of the polygon is either preserved or flipped, depending on the transformation you did. Remember that only the rotations form a subgroup, because they are the only block that contains the identity transformation, the zero degree rotation. The Cayley graph always consists of two cycles going in opposite directions. That's because as soon as you flip the polygon over, the rotations go in the other direction. Because these groups always consist of two blocks, or two rings in the Cayley graph, they are known as the dihedral groups. The word dihedral means two-sided, referring to the two sides of the polygon. The distinction between symmetries that preserve orientation and those that don't plays a big role in physics later. In upcoming videos we will dive deeper into the mysterious internal structure that many groups have. 
The distinction between rotations and reflections is only one of many block structures we will discover. This will reveal many mathematical concepts, such as prime numbers, parallel lines, and more. You would never expect those concepts and connections to be lurking in the simple rules for groups. I will show you in detail where this rich internal structure comes from. You can already watch those videos right now on Patreon. Our channel can really use your support. Don't forget to subscribe and to like and share this video. Thank you very much and see you next time.